This is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices All Stars Episode 64 was recorded on September 27th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. All-star Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital is back with us today. Brent, I want to pick up on an interview that we just aired on Friday with Juliet de Klerk, predicting that by the end of Q4, Juliet thinks that quantitative easing will be reintroduced by the Fed. And of course, uh, there's been a lot of calls for people who think that the Fed needs to do something about the liquidity situation. First of all, do you agree with that? But even if you don't agree with that, What would it mean if there was a return to QE to your outlook for the dollar and your expectations of the dollar moving higher against other currencies? Yeah. Hi. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me back again. And yeah, that's uh, it's obviously a topic of conversation. And I have several friends and people that I respect highly that that agree with Juliet. Uh, I don't happen to think that that is going to be the case. I do not think that the U.S. is going to have to do that big of a pivot back to do full QE in the next three months. Um, Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be another rate cut. It doesn't mean that they might not have to provide some liquidity along the way, but I'm just not convinced that they need to. I'm not convinced that they need to do QE at all. I'm still not convinced that it's coming back. If it is, and it does, then I'll say I was wrong. But as of right now, I don't think it will happen, and I don't think it's necessary to happen. I do understand the reasons for the argument that, that it will come back. And I think if it did... I think that would signal two things to me. One, I think it would probably, at least in the very short term, be bad for the dollar. And when I say bad, the dollar would likely sell off a bit. But I don't think that it would completely derail you know, my call for the dollar to go higher. And ultimately, I would, ex- if they do do it, I don't think that they will do enough. And I think all it would do would delay the eventual dollar rise. The reason I say that is think about the situation that not just the U.S., but that the world would be in if the U.S. is in such trouble that we're going back to QE, that would signal that there's a huge deflationary environment out there, not just in the U.S., but in the global economy. And while the dollar may weaken on the headline of the QE announcement and, you know, whatever they do for the, let's call it, maybe for the first three to six months, the dollar weakens a little bit. But what I don't think would happen is I don't think behavior would change. And what I mean by that is I don't think people or institutions and entities around the world would all of a sudden, you know, become fiscally responsible, start taking that opportunity to pay down their debt and get back on a fiscal, you know, disciplined track. I think what they would do is they would just double down on what they've already done. And so six to nine months, we'd be right back where we started. The debts would be bigger. You know, the emerging economies and the international entities that owe 13 trillion in U.S. dollar debt would now owe 14 trillion in U.S. dollar debt or whatever the number is. And I don't think it would solve it at all. I think it would just delay it. Um, If QE was going to solve everything, why are we still here after 10 years of uh, crazy monetary policy? So I actually think that it would, I think it would ultimately fail in what they're trying to do. I think it would be short term bad for the dollar, but, you know, medium to long term, I think would be right back where we started. Okay. So you don't think it's going to happen if it does, the dollar goes down, but you see that as a buying opportunity. Let's move on to gold because I have generally been in agreement with you that, hey, uh, clearly the bull market is on, but we're way overdue for a pullback. But every time it seems like maybe a pullback is starting, something crazy happens in the world and and gold just rockets up on the, the risk premium. Do you still think that we're going to see a meaningful pullback from where we are? Yes, I do. I think that we're going to go back to the breakout zone of the 1370 to 1400. I believe that we'll at least go back to there, potentially even lower, but I think we'll at least go back to there. Now, again, I I own gold. Um, I think everybody should own gold. I've owned gold for over 10 years. This isn't me saying that everybody should go out and sell all their physical gold because, uh, you know, gold is a worthless asset. I just don't happen to think it's going to pay off right now. If I'm wrong and it goes higher, I already own gold. I will be fine. It's not a problem. I'm just if, if you know if somebody asks me what I think, I'm going to tell them what I think, and I, I think that gold is going to go back to the breakout zone. And why do you think that? Well, for for several reasons. One is I think that as the dollar breaks out, I think that will be a headwind for gold in U.S. dollar terms. Now, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. All of these answers depend on what currency you're denominated in. I'm speaking as a U.S. dollar investor. 
if I was sitting in Australia or Europe or Canada or Japan or China, I'd be buying gold hand over fist. But, you know, I'm not. I'm, I sit in San Francisco. I'm denominated in dollars. And I already own gold, so I don't feel like I need to buy more of it. But part of the reason I think it's going back is, uh, you know, sentiment has gotten kicked down a little bit in the last, uh, call it month, but it's still fairly high. And, you know, one of the big things that I look at is the commitment of traders. Now, I have a lot of people who tell me the commitment of traders doesn't matter. I have a lot of people that tell me the commitment of traders changes when you get into a bull market and it doesn't have the same significance as it does in a bear market. But when I sit there and I look at it and I see that the banks and the, the commercials, which are the banks and the producers, have their biggest short position in history. And then I look at the speculators and they have their biggest position in history. That has typically not worked out well for the speculators. Now, can it, can it be different this time? Of course it can. But I don't think that it will be. Again, if I get it wrong, I'll say I got it wrong, but I expect that to change. I expect the banks and the producers to get out from under their short position that's probably got an average price of, I don't know, 1350 to 1450 And so I, I think that that will be a, a part of it. I also think, Eric, that, you know, and th this is where I'm going to disagree a little bit with, with several of my friends in the gold world is about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago now, there used to be this uh, gold agreement between all the central banks that they would not they would not sell in a coordinated fashion but that has been removed and so a lot of people say oh they're removing the the sales agreement because they want to come in and buy but here's the thing it was a sales agreement it wasn't an agreement not to buy it, it was an agreement not to sell in unison or in a coordinated fashion now if they had no intention of selling why would they remove that provision I think what's going to happen is as we move forward into the crisis, you know, I've been calling for a currency crisis for a couple of years now. I think it's going to you know, have several knock on effects around the world. I think as individual countries come into danger or come in, into crisis, they will have to sell some of their gold in order to fund their their operations and their government administrations, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't think that they will want to sell their gold. But that is the reason that you buy gold. It's the reason I buy gold. It's the reason I tell clients to buy gold. It's the reason that many people around the world buy gold is you use it in a crisis. Now, just because we might not be in a crisis in the U.S. and we don't want to sell our gold, you know, if you live in Argentina or Turkey or Venezuela, Russia, Cyprus, some, at some point over the last five years, you've been in crisis. Gold went up in your currency terms and it was sold in order to get out of that crisis. And I think as countries come into crisis around the world over the next couple of years, some of these central banks will end up selling their gold holdings. Now, maybe China won't sell theirs. Maybe Russia won't sell theirs. But I think some of these central banks will be selling gold. And I think, you know, will it be bought? Of course, it'll be bought. That's the great thing about gold is it's liquid in an environment. But I'm just not convinced yet that it's time in dollar terms for gold to rocket up. Now, Again, it's an insurance policy. You don't really want to trade in and out of your insurance policy. But if you're asking me whether I think it pays off huge in the next three months, uh, my answer is no. Let's move on to the stock market, both domestically and globally, because one of the most interesting disparities that I see is, boy, it's awfully clear, Brent, that since the beginning of 2018, most global stock markets have been selling off. But the, the U.S. S&P 500 is within a stone's throw of all-time highs, as we're speaking on Friday. What is driving that disconnect? And, and I guess the other thing that comes to mind is I agree with you that quantitative easing and monetary policy easing in general doesn't really solve any long-term problems. But boy, if there's anything that's been proven unequivocally in recent years, it's that in the short term, it, it, it's a boost to equity prices. So what would it mean if we do get a return? I, I guess let's start with the disparity in global versus domestic markets. But what happens then if we do get, whether it's quantitative easing or just some other form of easing, if we get easier monetary policy, what happens to the stock market from here? Well, that's a, that's a good intro to one thing I kind of want to bring up a little bit regarding um, QE, easy money policy, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I'm going to tie it into the dollar here a little bit. I know, I know this question wasn't specifically on the dollar, but, you know, I've been on record that I think that equities are going much higher. And I still believe that's the case over the next, call it a couple of years. Um, I do think that as we go into the Q4 here, I think it's very possible that we have a Q4 in 2019 similar to the Q4 in 2018. If that is true and that happens, I think there will be some kind of a policy response. Again, I don't necessarily think that it's QE, but it could be QE. But as, uh, as that happens, 
Sure. If, if, if QE comes in, I think that would provide some liquidity and that would help the stock market. But again, you know, we've talked about this before. I don't necessarily think that we need QE for the stocks to go higher. I think as the world goes into crisis, I think that the U.S. dollar will get a safe haven bid. I think capital will flow to the United States. And as that capital flows to the United States, I think that kind of acts as artificial QE. In other words, the liquidity coming in from the overseas would be similar to the liquidity being uh, injected by the, the U.S. central bank. And I think that's a big part of the reason why capital has gone up or the, the S&P has gone up over the last three, four, five years in the United States. I mean, look at look at the DAX, that's the German stock market in U.S. dollar terms over the last five years, and it's gone absolutely nowhere. While if you look at the S&P 500 in U.S. dollar terms, it's it's gone up significantly. Again, that's just it's just another example of the U.S. outperforming on a relative basis. And again, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, it's on a relative basis relative to the rest of the world. I'm not making the argument that the U.S. is in fantastic shape. I just think that we're in better shape than everywhere else. But I think that is kind of, but to, back to your point regarding QE, if we have a sell-off in Q4 and they do come back with some kind of a policy response, I think that that not only would, uh, would the stock market go higher, but it could potentially give it a, a quick little boost to get it going. But again, I just want to be clear. I don't think QE is necessary in the U.S. for U.S. equities to go higher. Brent, that makes perfect sense. Let's come back specifically to what is the driver that has caused the U.S. market to stay where it's been even since the beginning of 2018? It's very clear if you look around the world that there's been uh, other markets selling off. Is it because the U.S. economy is a little better than the rest of the world? Is it because the rest of the world has been in more easy monetary policy than we've been in during that time? What is the reason that that disparity has existed in the first place? So I, th I think it's a factor of several things. One, again, like it or not, and I know a lot of people don't like it, but like it or not, the United States is still the world hegemon and the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency. So regardless of whether people want to use the dollar or like using the dollar, they must use the dollar. Now, someday that will change. But as of right now, the way the current monetary system is designed, you need dollars. And so the fact that the world needs dollars to operate gives us a natural flow of funds to the dollar, which then ends up in dollar assets. I think that's part of it. The other part is on a relative basis, our rates have been higher than the rest of the world. You know, our rates have been anywhere from one and a half to three percent over the last year or two years, whereas a lot of the rest of the world has been zero to negative for, you know, the last call it 18 to 24 months. So just on a relative basis, again, we look pretty good. So if, if, if we pay more than everybody else and you need to use our currency anyway, it's not a real hard decision to allocate the dollars. Another part of it is Trump's tax policies, right? He has encouraged investment into the United States. And so that has that has led to uh, a relative outperformance. Now, here's a thing that almost nobody in the United States knows. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. There's probably a lot of people who know, but it's not widely talked about. And that is that, you know, a lot of times when you when you hear about offshore money or sending money offshore, you'll think in the Americans will think of place like, you know, the Cayman Islands or Singapore or Switzerland. But the rest of the world, you know, where they look for offshore is the United States. For, for non-Americans, the United States is the biggest offshore money center in the world. And part of the reason is that we have encouraged capital to come here. We have policies in place that encourage capital to come here. There's this, uh, there's this global coordinated tax policy call th that has to do with FATCA. It's driven by the United States. Whenever an American sends money overseas, those overseas financial institutions have to report back to the IRS whether we have funds abroad. But this is not a reciprocatory, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, reciprocatory policy. In other words, if Brazilians send money to the United States, the United States doesn't turn around and notify the Brazilian tax authorities. We don't turn around and notify the Japanese tax authorities. We don't turn around and notify the German tax authorities. So, you know, it's a very one-sided thing. We want to know, we want to make sure we get all our taxes, but we're not necessarily going to guarantee that you get all yours. And so we are seen as a big, for big, big high net worth individuals that are based overseas, we are one of the biggest destinations, if not the biggest destinations for flow of funds. So I think it's kind of a combination of all these different things. And then, you know, the relative rule of law on a 
you know, we have a court system and we have an SEC. Now, you know, I'm critical of all those institutions and I'm not saying that they're perfect. But as, again, on a relative basis, the U.S. looks pretty good. If you're a billionaire trying to diversify your money out of your home country and uh, put it someplace else, the United States looks pretty good. Brent, briefly, the repo crisis. We've had uh, quite a few people comment on it between Jeff Snyder and Juliet DeClerc and so forth. Any perspective that you want to add to what's going on, what's driving this liquidity squeeze? Sure. Well, you know, the first thing I'm going to say is I'm not a repo expert. Uh, I think it's kind of funny the number of repo experts that have shown up on social media and Twitter and uh, the blogosphere over the last two weeks. You know, two weeks ago, nobody even knew what... um, repo was and now everybody thinks that they have a huge opinion on it. And so I, while I do not you know, work in the weeds of it and I don't claim to be an expert on it, I understand from a big picture what's going on. And it essentially comes back to this dollar shortage. There is a lack of liquidity in the dollar right now because there's this big supply demand imbalance. And I've been talking about this for a couple of years. It's taken longer to develop than I thought, but it's starting to play out. You know, you would think that uh, if everything was fine, money would flow freely, people would lend freely, but it's not fine and there's not enough dollars to go around. And so as firms, banks, you know, financial institutions hoard their dollars and don't loan them out and make them liquid and available to other firms that need them, um, it has caused uh, pressure in in U.S. dollar funding. And I think that it's manifesting itself in, in U.S. markets or as far as U.S. funding markets. And, you know, a lot of people say the fact that we had this spike in repo, but yet the dollar didn't jump significantly is significant because it indicates that it's a U.S. internal problem and not a rest of the world problem. But, you know, the people that say this, I don't think quite have an understanding of what is happening because a big part of what is happening is the reserves that sit at the Federal Reserve for the commercial banks. And they have chosen to keep those in safe custody at the Fed rather than loan them out into the repo market, which pays a higher rate. Even though repo spiked, they still didn't loan those out. And again, so people have said this is indicative that it's a U.S. bank issue. But what people, these same people don't realize is that a huge part of the reserves that sit at the Federal Reserve are owned by foreign financial institutions. So if you, if you look at the, the monetary base, part of the monetary base is bank excess reserves or bank reserves at the Fed. And at about 30 to 40 percent of bank reserves at the Fed are owned by foreign financial institutions. So it could be that it's, uh, you know, it's these foreign firms that are hoarding their dollars because they need dollars so badly for their dollar funding issues as well. So the idea that just because it's U.S. repo that it's spiking, that it's specifically a U.S. issue is completely misdiagnosed, in my opinion. Brent, before we close, you manage a fund which is designed to take advantage of some of the knock-on effects of this dollar crisis. How about sharing uh, some of the trade ideas that you're actually trading in your fund? Sure. I can't go into too much detail, but I'll tell you one of the themes that, uh, that we think is we think as the U.S. dollar gets stronger, it's going to put enormous pressure on the rest of the world. And the rest of the world will be forced to respond in kind from a policy response. The last remaining holdout of uh, easy money policy right now, if you look around the world, Australians cutting rates, Europe's cutting rates, the U.S. cut rates, South America's cut rates, New Zealand's cuts rates. The whole world is in easy mode. The, the one remaining um, holdout is Canada. And we think that uh, Canada is in as much trouble as anybody else. And perhaps we could make the argument that they're in more trouble than a lot of other people. Uh, I don't have the time to go into all the details of that is. But long story short, we think that... We think that Canada, the Bank of Canada is going to have to react. We think that they are going to have to cut rates. And we think that uh, they may even have to go back to some form of QE. And so we've been uh, playing some options, betting that, that the Bank of Canada is going to have to cut and cut aggressively. And uh, if we get that right, the positions that we have on um, should do extremely, extremely well. So we're pretty excited about uh, some of the positions that we have on. Uh, you know, the dollar itself, when you look at it against some of the majors, it's it, it's kind of breaking out, but it's still kind of within this range. But if you look around the world on a more broad basis, uh, look at the Asian dollar index, look at the broad dollar index, look at it versus a number of emerging market countries. Uh, the dollar has clearly broken out. And I think the move's just getting started. So we're, we're very excited. Brent, as we close, please tell our listeners your Twitter handle and where they can follow you and find out more about what you do at Santiago Capital. 
Yeah, so I'm pretty active on Twitter. It's at Santiago AU Fund. You can also just go into the search menu and type in Santiago Capital. You'll find me. I'm also on email, Brent at SantiagoCapital.com. I come on and do uh, you know macro voices at least once a month, if not more often than that. Happy to you know answer any questions that kind of come through that channel as well. I always try to respond when people uh, are gracious enough to reach out to me. Sometimes I forget. Sometimes I miss it. Don't be afraid to email me again or remind me. Um, it does get a little tough to respond to everybody, but uh, I appreciate the dialogue and I'm always happy to uh, see if I can help. Fantastic. We look forward to getting you back for another update in a month or so. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices.